Awesome, thanks. So um, my name is David O. Uh, I head developer relations at Meta. And what that basically means is that I'm the voice for the developers. A little bit about me. Uh, I've been developing games for 10 years at Ubisoft. Some games you may have heard of. I'm also the founder of Cherry Games, which is a free-to-play games network to play games and donate to charity. And uh, I've had three years of game, uh, games and enterprise development around virtual reality while I was at Leap Motion. And now I'm currently at Meta. We do augmented reality. But most importantly, I believe in the future. I'm a futurist. As a Korean American, I'm 42 years old. 40 years ago, Korea was a third world country. And through technology and a lot of hard work, I got to see a country revolutionize itself to become an economical powerhouse. So I really do believe technology is here to help us. So a little bit about Meta. Meta uh, was started by Marone Gribbets. He's the one on the top left corner. And uh, he is also a uh, computer scientist that studied uh, com computer science at Columbia, as well as studying neuroscience. Um, that's his co-founder, Ray Lowe on the right. And uh, below Ray, uh, Ray is also, he was originally the CTO, but also very focused on the technology of Meta. And below Ray is Steve Mann. Steve Mann, if you don't know, is kind of like the godfather of wearables. He was actually one of the first ones to actually don a, a, a display tied to a computer uh, over 20 years ago. And um, also now currently a visiting professor um, at, at Stanford, and also uh, our chief scientist. <clears throat> to the left of Steve is uh, Steve Feiner, and Steve Feiner was also a professor at Columbia and also worked closely with Marone. Um, he is an expert in computer human interaction, so uh, there's a lot of mind trust that goes into the company. So a little bit about what augmented reality versus virtual reality is. So I think someone asked the question earlier of how many people have tried AR, VR. How many of you tried AR before? Can I see a raise of hands? Cool. So cool. We have a really mature crowd, so that's great. Um, basically, virtual reality, just to give you an idea, takes you outside to another world, another universe. This is alt space. And in alt space, you don a VR headset. You can actually be a virtual avatar. You can communicate with people, play games. Um, there was an instance where people are understanding some of the social norms around VR. Uh, people were feeling like accosted when avatars were getting too close and feeling harassed. So these are all new cultural norms that we're going to have to figure out and figure out how to solve. So augmented reality, what I do, is bringing holograms into the world. Holograms into your real environment to enhance the environment. And so AR wouldn't exist with VR. This is an actual ad from Cyber Edge magazine 20 years ago, from 1997. Um, this kind of gives you an understanding, like, this has been around. Um, but as you can tell by the graphic on the left corner there, um, it wasn't very good. I don't even know what that is. Um, also, uh, that's the data glove. We had hand tracking, but that looks very uncomfortable and uh, pretty silly. Um, and then, of course, with the headsets back then, this one advertised uh, a really wide field of view called the Cyber Eye, but it looked pretty ridiculous. And um, I doubt if she was really having that much of a good time <laughs> while posing for that photo. Um, so that's where we're at. And um, so it's been a long time where this technology has progressed. And of course, by doing so, we're at today. This is my niece and nephew, Marley and Isabel. And uh, that's just a Samsung phone tied to a Samsung gear, of course. And when I, you know, like me, like their uncle, they love playing video games. And um, one thing that they love play more than video games is VR. And the first time I actually brought them home a Meta headset and they tried augmented reality for the, for the first time, they said, wow, this is the best thing ever. And I asked Marley, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, it just makes the world better. And from my understanding of delving in deep and asking him questions, you know, I really think that it has to do with being present. And we all know kind of what presence is all about, but this is the crux of what augmented reality was going to solve. So what presence does is consciously have your brain aware of the current moment. And the reason why that's important, of course, in psychology and meditation, presence allows you to be very cognizant of your surroundings, be alert, but also be empathetic of who you are with your own consciousness evolve. And I really do believe presence can change the world, and I do believe augmented reality can change the world. 
And so how? So I've got um, 20 minutes here. Um, so let's start 10,000 years back to the cave paintings of uh, prehistoric times where you see these handprints. Um, a side note is that these handprints, they're now saying, qu there's quantifiable data saying that these handprints are actually from women, so cave women at that time. And these artists um, were actually at adult height, and they could tell by the size of their hands that these were women. But they still don't try to understand like, what the context of it was. Now, it could be several different hypotheses, like you know, it's a portal to another world, it's a religious ceremony around hunting or fertility, but at the same time, it's what's really important is that that artist, when you, people experience these paintings in real life, they have a real awe sense of presence because they connect with that person who actually made that mark on a 2D surface, trying to communicate and try to speak to that viewer. And for that viewer, they actually, for the first time, really feel cognizant of being present and making that connection. But again, we relied on tools of those prehistoric times of, of paint, of some kind of charcoal, but making that mark as human beings on a 2D surface. Now, 500 years uh, ago, we have Leonardo da Vinci and the advent of the Renaissance, and you know, we're trying to manipulate parchment paper and ink into a 3D world, into a 3D environment. And um, you know, what, one thing that's really interesting about us trying to always recreate our environment through technology is the simple fact that we're always trying to progress to make this understanding more believable. And we do this today with 2D monitors, in this case, a uh, 2D display, a window, now being able to look at three-dimensional objects but in 2D. And we've done that now, miniaturizing it on a phone. That's actually an Uber driver. I don't know how many people have actually been in an Uber car and someone actually texting or calling the phone, but it's horrifying. And I'm pretty sure, uh, I don't know if he actually feels very present, but I'm sure the passenger does. And uh, I'm sure it was pretty frightening. But that's where we're at. That's where we're at in this technology. And so we're 3D creatures. We're now able to represent CGI 3D models on 2D surfaces. But with AR, you're now able to interact with these 3D objects as if they're physical objects in your room. So now understanding the context of what that means, it means a lot. Uh, I don't know uh, what from 2D, to two dimensions to 3D, what that actually means for mankind, but I know it means something, and I know it's going to be very important. So we're all 3D. We are 3D creatures. Um, we actually think in 3D, which I'll go into the neuroscience behind it. But really what our technology does is really extend the mind. And what we believe is that by being present and by innovating on this technology, we can really advance ourselves. I know I don't want to live in a future where I don't, I'm sure you guys experienced like hunkering on a keyboard and after a day you just feel really, really exhausted, but I don't want to evolve this way. I'm sure that if we continue down this path, we will all have some physical ailments and that will not be good. Um, and I don't want to live in this reality either, where you're closed off from the world and not being able to experience life. So augmented reality, well, it hit mainstream, mainstream America uh, this July, where um, Pokemon Go was released in July. And for the first of the year of January, uh, it raised over $1 billion of revenue. And uh, that just shows a need of why people want to augment their lives. This family in particular looked like they're actually having a really good time, but they're not connecting. There's no eye contact. There's no bonding. But we really believe that AR is very important. But we believe that there should be more connection between people to really increase social bonds. So this is the Meta One. This was released uh, several years ago in 2013 of May. And what we offered then was portability, uh, a, a small field of view because of the portability aspect. Um, and also because of the portability aspect, we didn't have very much high resolution. So a lot of our customers had said, hey, we're looking at holograms. We want to see them in a real wide field of view. We want to actually see really detailed, highly rendered imagery. And so with that, we really listened to the customer, and this is the Meta 2. We started shipping several months ago to some select partners, and we're sending out all of our pre-orders by the end of the year. And with the Meta 2 headset, um, people are really raving about it. So I'm just going to start a video and, and, and show you what, how other people are experiencing the Meta 2. I just tried the Meta development kit, and I was completely blown away. 
the best augmented reality heads up display that I've experienced. There was something, something special about this experience that you can't, you can't quite articulate. I mean, you just have to do it. It's definitely here and it's definitely real. I'm emotional because I've, I've never seen a product like this since the Macintosh. I was really, 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 really impressed. It blew me away. I didn't think that this, the, the graphical look was going to be that high resolution. And it really, it's amazing. You can almost like taste it. It's great. I'm blown away, you know. That was really amazing that I could just like grab something, pull it around. The Meta 2 comes closer than anything I've seen to what I imagined that augmented reality would eventually be. To see that for the first time was, was really an extraordinary thing and truly a glimpse into the future of exploration, I think. What I just tried was so unbelievable, so much further along than anything I could have expected, that it upsets me that I can't literally leave the hotel and bring this technology with me. If, if you're interested in developing for AR, like this is the device. Jump on the bandwagon and start developing. All developers should definitely come to Meta. They are the future. They are the best. Now is where you establish yourself as a pioneer for where the industry is going to be going and uh, make a name for yourself. So go ahead. Get the Meta. It's awesome. I think the time has come for a much more natural machine, a machine that leverages the power of neuroscience to be an extension of our senses instead of going against them. We're no longer confined by the dimensions of the screens on our desks or the rectangles in our pockets. Instead, we can have the whole world as our desktop background. If you've been thinking about developing for augmented reality, now is the time to finally make your dreams come true. Cool, so that's the Meta 2. Um, and in terms of the specifications, uh, we have 90 degree field of view, really wide field of view so you can see holograms, they don't get cut off. The average uh, AR headset is actually 33 degrees. So what that means is when you put on the headset, you'll be looking at like, for example, a digital representation of the globe and that top and bottom half will be cut off. And so we offer a really wide field of view. Another thing we offer is actually hand tracking. Hand tracking we believe is a zero learning interface. You don't have to learn any manual. You can actually just use your hands. And we allow you to directly manipulate 3D models. And of course, SLAM, which allows us to spatialize the room, to have, have a context of what the floor, where the floor is, where to place holograms on a specific object. I can actually project through a meta headset and actually have a wall size monitor at any, any place in the room. But that's what SLAM allows us to do. So in short, we allow digital layers on top of the world. And with these layers, we can contextualize more information, deeper meaning in the real environment, and at the same time, making social connections, because I can be here with you and present. This video here kind of showcases what it means for education. So this is Forrest. Forrest actually architected our computer vision, and he's actually looking through a 3D holographic uh, representation of the brain. This was actually shot through the meta glasses, so no trickery here. We also offer a collaboration, which is going to be a big part of what meta is all about, sitting together around a holographic campfire and interacting with a digital object together. So with the 2.5K resolution, you can actually notice the different strands of neurons. And that's really important when you're interacting with 3D models. We're now interacting with 3D models, again, like they're physical. And what that means for education and design, I think it's going to be something very special. So with collaboration, what does that mean? Uh, most recently at Sundance, we actually had a collaboration piece where two people at the same time were actually interacting with the same hologram at a given moment, which was kind of new and really special, and the press really loved it, and it was very special. But that whole bonding, when people actually sit down together and manipulating a digital hologram, that, that feeling is something like nothing else. You actually feel like you're experiencing magic for the first time. And through that magic, you feel like you can actually understand the technology even more. This is another video that shows collaboration at work, in this case with a, a, bl a digitalized blueprint. With that blueprint, you're able to expand that into 3D. With hand interaction, you can actually directly manipulate a building, for example, pull out a floor from that floor, directly manipulate different floor plans. And you're able to do that in the headset in real time. 
So how do we do all this? Well, like Marone had said er earlier, it's really about neuroscience. Uh, we actually use neuroscience in the study of the mind. Uh, Marone actually studied neuroscience, where that's, our that's gonna be our competitive advantage. We actually understand, we have the most neuroscientists than any other company in Silicon Valley. So we're understanding how the brain works and how to extend the mind through the different cues of the brain to extend this technology and push it forward. And this is uh, Stefano Baldassi. Stefano actually is a uh, professor of neuroscience at Stanford, and he was a acclaimed professor in Italy. But he actually joined Meta, and for two years, he's been actually researching with his team of UX designers and neuroscientists on really how to capitalize this technology to push things forward. And with this, he actually designed the spatial interface guidelines. We haven't released all of them yet, but I'm gonna give you three. We've released one of them, and they're very special to me. They're very dear to my heart because these different principles really understand the correct way the actual brain works to extend how we can interact with holograms. And the first principle is called think spatial. Think spatially around you. And um, how it evolved, here's a, a, a picture of the iPhone. And with that small screen size, what we've done is taken these metaphors of icons and fitting them on a tall, small little screen. And they're very abstract, and you know, some people do design them very well. But at the same time, these are abstract metaphors that we're trying to condense. And it's the what. What are these icons doing, right? But what we want to promote is the spatial understanding of where around you can you interact with these holograms. Because they won't be a 2D interface. They won't be just buttons. Because that's not how we actually interact in the real world. Like, through this metaphor, we've had nested windows, um, different icons and cursors, and this ca causes a lot of ambigu ambiguity. And in real life, we don't have that. We actually have signs and tools around us that kind of point us the way. And also with hand tracking, we believe that hands understanding spatially, all that comes to understanding your spatial environment. And we do this today. You know, when you're working in front of your desk, you know where your 2D post-its are, you know where your 3D tools like the mouse and the keyboard are. And, and that's very important. We, our, our brains are, are wired this way. And it's based on neuroscience. Kravitz actually uh, worked on a research paper really defining a new neural uh, framework for visuospatial processing. What that means is um, the brain works in understanding of the where and the what. Uh, the the um, bottom there, the, it starts with the striate cortex where the OC is and travels the signals from the retina when you actually press that button on an iPhone, it gives you an understanding of what that button does. But there's this whole other path of the where that's not being utilized, you know? There, there's maybe at times where where is, is fundamental, like actually navigating through many assortment screens, but that's not the primary pur purpose of actually finding a specific application. But the breakthrough, what Kravitz actually figured out, was that there's also a how. How does, these, how does that button work? Or how does this microphone work? Like, how is it placed within the room? How do, I, how do I access it to be able to use it? And this how is really important because this how actually is a framework, this new pathway that actually starts from uh, the, uh, the, the V1 area here and moves to the posterior per, uh, 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 perarial and uh, through the medial uh, temporal lobe and down to the premortal and prefrontal cortex. And what that does is gives you an understanding of space. Like this carpenter, he's able to come down a ladder and understand exactly where each step might be and at the same time where his screwdriver might be on this tool belt. But all that is an, a pathway that's neglected if we're just utilizing a 2D interface. That whole pathway, is, that's not how we're wired. So this new paradigm shift when we're interacting with holograms, we really want to push that because we feel like that can lead to more innovation. The second spatial interface principle is minimizing abstraction. And minimizing abstraction means in this whole new universe, we're not going to be looking at 2D icons. Um, does, does anyone know what this 2D icon stands for? Yeah, it could be a Phillips head screwdriver. Uh, or it could also be a uh, add sign, right? Or, um, you know, for a window, adding something. Now, if you just Shift it around, it could also mean subtract, right? A lot of abstractions here, right? And, um, you know, this is actually another 2D interface icon. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah. 
Eraser, exactly. So if you know Photoshop, this is an eraser. Um, or it could be a magic cigarette. Who knows, right? But it's, it's confusing. And, um, you know, this is an eraser, right? And by minimizing abstraction and understanding the volume, the, the brain automatically understands just based on the curvature of that object, that little, uh, that little indent on the side there, the brain automatically reverses engineers what this object is to understand how to grab it immediately. Isn't that amazing? Your brain does that, and that's how we should be pushing this technology. We shouldn't be confined and constrained into these abstractions that don't really progress us. And this is based on neuroscience of, of uh, uh, Rizzoletti. Rizzoletti had understood how this cortical motor system, the motor system, of course, you know, understands the senses and the limbs and understands what your hands and arms are doing and your legs. But there's a part in the brain called the F5. And that F5, is the, is their, its sole purpose is to reverse engineer any object you look to figure out how you're going to be able to grasp that thing. And in this case, that's really clear without even seeing the Staples logo what that object might be able to do or how you're able to grab that object just based on the curvature and the size. The last spatial interface principle I'm going to share with you is the world is your file system. We're now entering this new paradigm where, again, I started this conversation about from 2D jumping into 3D, and what does that mean for us as a, as a species? Well, that's loud. Um, but I don't know what that is. OK, so uh, you know, I'm going to give you an example of, um, uh, you know, you've probably all done this before, where you're actually trying to look for a file on your computer. But you know, did I put it? Did I nest it in this folder? How did I get there? I, I don't. You know, there's a lot of ambiguity. And of course, the other you know uh, solution would be, hey, let's just use voice. Well, what if you forget the name of that particular file that you're looking for? Well, that's what we mean by minimizing abstractions and also by spatially putting 3D objects in your environment. Like we don't believe that this new paradigm of VR and AR, we're going to rely on the on the right side of the screen on 2D. Menus. I just described to you that's not how our brains are wired. But instead, we're going to have holograms in your physical space. I'm going to have my virtual inbox that I can get into. I'll have a holographic desktop where I'll be able to place holograms in. I'll know exactly um, some of my shaping tools that I'll be able to have and control within my desktop. But spatially understanding where everything is by understanding by the volume, volume of these 3D models, of these tools, I'll understand how to work with them. And this is also based on the research of Moser um, regarding the understanding of the microstructure of spatial map uh, in the cortex itself. And if you guys want to know more, I really highly suggest you log on to our website and, and just basically input so you can get these spatial interface guidelines. And if you guys want to try the meta, um, we're also going to be demoing um, at a conference. Please go check our uh, schedule. Um, Ty is really awesome, but we weren't able to uh, schedule a demo in time. But we will be demoing it at uh, Augmented World Expo. So thank you so much. I know uh, this was a long uh, panel of VR and AR. So I guess uh, we'll open it up to the questions, the Q&A. That's a great question. So the question was, hey, look, with these different uh, brands, they might be able to showcase for different AR glasses. Are they going to be interacting together? Is that the question? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I don't know if, uh, for us uh, personally, we don't feel like it's part of also our spatial guidelines where you should really confuse uh, the user as well. I mean, uh, Miron gives an example of him waking up in the morning, and uh, as he opens up his eyes, he sees a Tyrannosaurus Rex right in front of him. And, in that Tyrannosaurus Rex's mouth, it's breathing heavily. You can almost feel the heat. There's a little let note that says, buy milk, right? Like, that's horrifying. I, I wouldn't want that. I, won't, I wouldn't want to live that life because, you know, it's unexpected. It also may cause psychosis. But there's going to be certain areas where that's going to be acceptable. Like, there's going to be certain walls allocated for advertising. And that's acceptable, right? Because if I want to interact with that piece of content, I can do so on my own will. Um, but I think that's a really interesting question, though. I, I, I don't know, actually. I don't know how, how that would play out, but I'm assuming that, you know, like, just like on a computer, you can uh, interact with different brands and different commercials. You can do so on different, different platforms. Cool.
Anything else? Well, thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Cool.